In this video, I have an interview with Eben Kursky. And Eben is an anthropologist and he wrote this amazing book called The Mutant Project about the Chinese genetically engineered twins, Lulu and Nana, and how that came about and all the world of genetically modifying ourselves, biohackers and much, much more. So, uh, Eben Kirksey, um, I wondered, uh, you were in the room when Jiang Kuhei announced the, yeah, the two uh, babies were born that were genetically modified. Um, did you remember how you felt at the moment? Well, e even before that moment on the summit floor, um, you know, I was, I was in the mix as the news broke. So I had just uh, come to Hong Kong on an a intercontinental flight from San Francisco. So I arrived uh, super jet lagged and checked into the conference hotel. Um, it was this really fancy venue called Le Meridian Cyberport Hotel. And um, I, you know, just did the usual, gave my passport over, filled in some forms and in the elevator, I ran into somebody else from the conference. I didn't really realize who it was at the time. It happened to be Robin Level Badge, the guy um, who was sort of the MC during during the event. And, and I just casually asked him, so, so are you here for the conference? You know, how, how's it going? And that's the moment I learned in, in the elevator talking to Robin Level Badge. And, um, you know, I just got a brief snippet in that uh, five seconds in, in the elevator ride and, you know, went into my hotel room and found that it was the main headline on CNN. So, you know, we were all there with prepared talks. I'd, I'd come with a, a slideshow all about um, biohackers and some artists that were experimenting with, with CRISPR. And in many ways, it was totally expected. You know, in, in my talk, I'd actually prepared uh, uh, to say some things about CCR5, the gene that uh, Dr. Ha had targeted. You know, people have been studying this for a long time. We know that if, if you have a rare mutation to this um, on both of your chromosomes, you're likely to be resistant to HIV. Um, so in some ways it was totally not surprising, um, but on the other hand, it, it really kind of, um, uh, shook reality up. You know, we, we had been thinking about this in speculative terms, almost in terms of science fiction. And here we were with the first genetically modified humans. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, when I decided to head to mainland China and do a um, in-depth ex ex exploration and investigation of, of what Dr. Ha actually did. Yeah, yeah. So also I, I hear you say, so the correct pronunciation is uh, Dr. Ha. Or not, I, I, yeah. should, I mentioned hey, but uh, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. He Zhang Kui is, is my, yeah. my best attempt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, was it also in uh, that moment at the uh, Le Meridier that, uh, <laughs> that you also decided to write a book or came that later? So I actually thought that I'd, I was done writing a book. <laughs> so I've been working on this book uh, since the first Human uh, Genome Editing Summit in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 20, uh, 2015. So, so I'd interviewed a lot of the, the world's first genetically modified people, the very first edited people in the world, some of whom were HIV positive activists. Um, others were, were young children, um, people suffering from leukemia who had signed up. Uh, for what later became the first FDA approved gene therapy. So I'd already been doing a lot of research and I thought my research was basically done. I was, I was planning on you know, doing some brief follow-up in China. I knew that a lot was going on, um, but I, I pretty much had a, a manuscript that was ready. So um, you know, there was this whole new twist of, of fate. Um, I just happened to gain the trust of, of key people in the lab and um, you know, I, I was able to tell the story of these two baby girls um, that hadn't been told before, some of the health problems they experienced at birth, but also the motivations of their parents and, and why they signed up and why Dr. Hu uh, conducted this, this very risky experiment in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I really get, like that part of the book because... Um, um, because I was not familiar with that. And I was really surprised that you indeed went to uh, the place where he, um, he was born. And what I also, and that, that indeed also talked with some of the people involved in the experiment, both on the lab side, as also the prospective parents. 
So um, yeah, for me, that was really uh, amazing. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and as a short bio, you're an American anthropologist who specializes in, uh, in science and justice. And you, uh, uh, you're now in Melbourne, is that correct? Yeah, in, in yeah. Australia, where the pandemic is more or less over, it seems. Yeah, yeah. And I, I always thought that, that anthropology was more um, yeah, looking at hunter-gatherer tribes, etc. So why did you decide to uh, focus on, on, on biohacking, genetic modification, these parts of uh, society? So for starters, I come to all of this with an undergraduate degree in anthropology, but also biology. So um, ever since the 90s, when, when I was an undergraduate student, I've been trying to integrate these, these two fields of knowledge. And you know, there, there were old school approaches to biological anthropology that tried to understand uh, human nature in terms of the genes that we inherit from our primate kin. Um, others who work to study, you know, um, what people eat and how animals and the environment uh, figure into, you know, also what it means to be human. But I, I've um, tried to take a different tack to explore um, uh, human associations with other kinds of life in terms of dynamic interactions. And at the same time, um, I, I got advanced training in this discipline called science and technology studies, working with Donna Haraway and, and other leading figures in that field. So, you know, ever since Donna Haraway wrote the Cyborg Manifesto in 1985, people in the humanities and social sciences have been really interested in how technology is rapidly changing what it means to be human. So at a time when many feminists were uh, sort of uh, afraid of technology, when, when people were afraid of the, the personal computer, even before the internet, many were rejecting technology, but the Cyborg Manifesto looked at ways of subversively and playfully engaging with technology. So e even back in 1985, Haraway was imagining playful and risky experiments that we might do with genetic engineering to change the human condition. Um, so, so my work as an anthropologist really stems from that, thinking about this, this long history of, um, of work in the humanities, of thinking about how science and technology is changing what it means to be human. Um, but also trying to integrate um, some, some of those insights uh, as a student that I got from the field of biology and trying to think in different ways about how biology is changing human culture, human society, and human political landscapes. Yeah, yeah I was also uh, really nicely surprised or that, that you also mentioned you have a uh, close professional relationship with Donna Haraway. Um, and I read it and I was like, wow, because at, at the moment I'm also working on an article on cyborg. So yeah, I also got back to the original uh, manifesto. So, um, so that, yeah, that's great. Thank you for your elaboration. Um, what I also liked about the book was that you um, uh, also got into CRISPR, of course, and you also talked with uh, Jennifer Doudna, or Doudna, I don't know how to pronounce her surname. <laughs> yeah, um, and that, um, uh, that, that in the media, there's the, uh, uh, like the, the processor analogy, but you uh, more compare it to a Reaper drone. Can you elaborate on that uh, yeah, metaphor analogy? Yeah, so the gene editing metaphor actually predates CRISPR. So one of the other molecular tools that I focus on in the book, Zinc Fingers, basically does the same thing. And um, you know, if you, if you look at the molecules, what actually happens is is that CRISPR or Zinc Fingers goes into the DNA double helix, grabs a hold of it, and breaks it, um, and then basically relies on the the cell repair mechanisms to botch the job. So what you're really doing with with CRISPR or Zinc Fingers is producing these targeted mutations. So I like to think of it as a Reaper drone. You know, you give a a, a drone with missiles some coordinates. Sometimes it takes out the terrorist, other times it takes out the wedding party, and sometimes it hits the wrong target entirely. So um, with, with CRISPR, you know, you can be pretty precise in terms of like locating a part of the genome that you want to induce mutation in, where you want to create that targeted damage. But you can't always predict the kind of damage that, that CRISPR is going to do. So a, a paper just published a, a couple of months ago showing that when you're just trying to make a small, tiny, you know, single letter of DNA change, often you're losing an entire chromosome. 
Um, and, and this became uh, uh, one of the problems identified in, in two of these young girls, or, or one of these one of these twins. Um, there, there was a, a, a long sequence of, of DNA that was missing in, in, in one of these babies that they identified um, before they implanted it. But they decided that since it wasn't in a coding region, since it wasn't a gene that was translated in a, into a protein that you would then see expressed as a visible um, or you know, a significant trait, that they could go ahead and, and do the experiment and do the implantation anyway. But you know, really in thinking about um, drones as a good metaphor for CRISPR, you know, it's, it's trying to emphasize that this is damage that we're causing. And we can't always predict that the ways, you know, as, as we're making this damage, the ways that it's gonna have unintended consequences. Mm, yeah, 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 this, I think that's really nice because um, sometimes I also have the feeling that, that CRISPR is like really precise and it can uh, edit the, the human in a, in a perfect way, but um, yeah, we're, we're not there yet, like you, like you uh, nicely put it. Um, I was also in, um, did you also talk with uh, Mr. He? Uh, so uh, yes, uh, from, from the floor of the summit, I, I asked him a question from the floor of the summit. And, um, you know, uh, my question was was basically about the fundamental ethics of his experiment. Um, so, uh, you know, after he delivered his presentation, which was full of technological uh, jargon and and um, you know detailed minutia, I, I basically just asked about his responsibility to these two children and. Um, in, in some ways, he didn't answer the question. He basically said that he had a responsibility to humanity to use this powerful new technology to, to help people. Um, and it was only later that I learned after, you know, uh, digging through some of the records from the lab, you know, some of the participant consent forms, I, I got access to the original data um, after he'd been detained by police and was able to talk to a lot of the key people um, uh, close to him and close to the experiment. And um, I did learn that he actually had a very um, responsible plan. You know, um, in the US, I followed some of these first um, gene edited people and the follow-up period was only like five years for some of them. And, you know, with these experiments, we don't really know yet what the long-term consequences are gonna be. Um, you know, for, for, for some of these patients who did uh, uh, participated in, in uh, experiments targeting CCR5 with zinc fingers over 10 years ago, you know, they've been walking around with these edited cells for a while. Um, two out of, out of four people I interviewed from that trial have had prostate cancer. So, you know, the, the company that did the experiment, Sangamo, has cautioned me against drawing hasty conclusions. It hasn't been well studied um, or well characterized if, if this prostate cancer had any relation to the gene editing experiment, like the jury's still out on that question. Um, but, you know, they, they should have had longer term follow up. So, so in Dr. Hu's case, I, I learned that he had taken out um, very robust health insurance plans um, for, for these two children, something that's, that's unheard of um, in at least the clinical trials that I was following in, in the US. Um, so you know, he, he had a, a, a very clear sense that you know, this, this was a profound um, disruptive experiment and he made a commitment um, uh, uh, to, to take care of these children. But maybe the tragic irony of, of the narrative arc of the story, the story that had him experience this meteoric rise to fame, you know, within, within a week, he went from being unknown to, you know, grabbing news headlines around the world. And then this catastrophic fall as he's detained after the summit and then later um, sentenced to three years in prison. Amidst all of that, um, this, this sense of responsibility, this obligation, the insurance plan, it never manifested. And in part that was because these, these two babies had health problems at birth. The, the insurance company um, wasn't prepared to issue a, a plan to children in the neonatal intensive care, care unit. Um, but also as a result of this government investigation and the ultimate imprisonment of Dr. Ha, you know, there, there wasn't another responsible individual or organization ready to step in and, and do that same um, you know, long-term care. You can't really do that if you're in prison. Mm, yeah. Do you know uh, or if he also had read the book? 
if, if he's read my book? Yeah. Um, actually, I don't. And, um, you know, at, at this point, um, you know, he's, he's still in prison. And um, uh, I think in about a year, three years will be up. So I, until then, it's, you know, it's, you can't really communicate with them. No, no. But is your book also published in, uh, in uh, China? No, it, has, it hasn't been. No, no. I can, I can imagine because um, there's also something I want to ask you. Um, like when the news broke and I was here in the Netherlands, I thought, well, that's, a, that's like a lunatic, uh, maverick uh, scientist. And of course, in, in a way, he also uh, has some part of it that yeah, he was in, in some way, he, 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 he went too quick, too far. But I got more understanding from, for him by reading your book, like his upbringing, uh, like his time in the US, uh, where he also in the whole, the whole uh, venture capital and, and innovation. And he was also mentioned uh, um, the Einstein of China. Um, so did also your uh, perspective of the man change over time? Definitely. And I came to understand his story as emblematic of the China dream. So the China dream in some ways is patterned after the American dream, sort of the, the self-made man. You know, he, he comes from a very impoverished background. Um, he was born in 1984, but that household didn't have electricity. They didn't have a phone, even at that point in time. And his, his brother was, was captivated by electricity. He went on to become a hydroelectric engineer. So they, they saw electricity come to the village when, when he was a little kid. Um, he had his first experience with modern medicine when he was in school. Um, you know, he, he was born at home, uh, uh, someone who wasn't a midwife, someone who didn't even have training as a midwife, basically a family friend, delivered him into the world. And he came out with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. And, you know, he, he could have died in those first moments. Um, there, there, you know, the nearest hospital was like a long walk and then a bus ride and in a distant city. And the family, frankly, couldn't afford a hospital visit, you know, we're talking like $100 a year, uh, you know, in, in US dollars at that point. Um, but, you know, later, he basically is able to work his way up, up through the ranks, you know, he gets really good grades in school, he goes to a magnet school called uh, the Xinhua uh, High School is is renowned, and it's a very old school. Um, but you know, on a national level, the Xinhua School isn't isn't much. He he graduated not in the very top of his class, but but up there, he had really good grades and um, went went to a, a well well known um, university in China that is also well known for sort of preparing students to study abroad. Um, so so in some ways, you know, his his story is not untypical of you know an Asian American. Um, exchange, you know, not exchange student, he came to do a PhD and later a postdoc. He, he very much had a life in California and Stanford when he was recruited back to China by this, this um, Thousand Talents program. But then, you know, that, that whole personal trajectory is also drawn into a national trajectory. So, so the China dream is also a slogan of President Xi. And in um, Xi's famous uh, China Dream speech, he calls on um, the Chinese people to become a country of innovators. The, the dream is to go from, um, you know, made in China to created in China. It's, it's a call for disruptive innovation. And it's a call not only for disruptive innovation in the field of biotechnology, but in the field of robotics, of autonomous systems, of artificial intelligence, of, of, of space uh, technologies. Um, so, so his innovations are not only situated in the innovation economy of Silicon Valley, which he was very much connected to through his advisor, Stephen Quake, someone who um, reportedly made billions with a series of startup companies, um, but he's also embedded in the entrepreneurial culture of China, and um, one that's particular to the place where he did his work, Shenzhen. So many people have heard of Hong Kong, um, but not everybody's heard of Shenzhen. But the likelihood is, you know, that the computers that we're talking on now, that this smartphone that I carry around in my pocket, it probably came from a big factory in Shenzhen. 
Um, so, so the imaginary of the 1980s was, you know, plastic toys and Cabbage Patch Kid dolls. Like that's that's where all these boom boxes and things were, were manufactured. But increasingly, Shenzhen has become a city of, of innovation and, and speed. Um, the idea of Shenzhen speed, you know, of doing innovation, of doing construction faster than anywhere else on earth has made the city self-consciously aspire to embrace the future itself. So, so this, is, this is kind of the, the cultural environment that he's working in. Um, the university that he was at, um, uh, uh, SUSTEC is, is the acronym, Southern University. What is SUSTEC? I can't remember. I just call it the acronym in the book. Um, but, you know, this, this is basically a startup campus. They, they um, had just founded the university when they, they hire uh, Dr. Hu with a very lucrative salary from Stanford and basically say, you know, do your thing. Like, you know, here's, here's all, all these university funds. We're going to help you um, meet up with members of the local Communist Party as well as um, investors who can support your experiment. So, so Dr. Hu was not a rogue scientist. He, he had an established university lab. He had this startup company called Direct Genomics that is situated in, in this, um, you know, kind of hip post-industrial neighborhood of, of Shenzhen. Um, he, you know, he had business dealings with financial magnates. Um, he had supporters in Beijing. He had supporters um, in the Communist Party in, in various levels of the government. Um, as, as well as, you know, some of these slick hospitals that I, I detail in the book. So, so one, one hospital, you walk in, it basically looks like you're in the Jetsons. Um, there, there's not the same robots running around, but it's, it's like that same aesthetic. It's, you know, white, but sort of pinkish with these like circular architectural elements and these chairs that have these like sort of V-backs on them. And, um, you know, this hospital endorsed the experiment. So, um, the story I tell is, is one that kind of makes sense in a particular cultural moment, um, in a particular historical moment in China. Um, but it's also a story of, um, you know, outrage by the Chinese public. Um, you know, after this experiment was done, people were just seriously concerned that, that human children were being treated as guinea pigs. And um, on social media, so the dominant platforms there are WeChat and, and Weibo. And um, you just saw takedowns from the scientific community, from you know regular average people in the street saying like, how dare you do this kind of experiment? I mean, there, there was some on there hailing him as China's Einstein. And um, you know, there were even early government um, state sanctioned newspapers like celebrating this as an innovative uh, uh, experiment. But those celebratory newspaper articles disappeared. And um, eventually, the whole conversation on social media goes silent. There's, there's basically this black hole of information in China now about the experiment. If, if you look on, on Weibo or, or WeChat now, um, and you search for this hashtag, um, uh, there's, there's a couple of different hashtags. But one had something astounding. It was like over billion interactions like you know that that's 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 something that's gone viral if, if you search for that same hashtag today you maybe find an archive of posts from the last couple of weeks so so people are still occasionally posting about dr ha and these genetically modified babies um but it's it's basically this erosion of collective memory mediated by the sensors so i i reflect on that in the book and um you know try to think about the, the lessons we might draw from this experiment, but also, yeah, the, the, the ways that, that it's basically been erased from public mem memory in China. Yeah, what I also found really interesting is like you mentioned, like in the beginning of the news broke, uh, when the news broke, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, indeed positive uh, mention on social media and then it was quickly taken over by like, uh, like you mentioned, uh, yeah, the horrified reactions and, and people that are um, being concerned. Um, so, what, what, but what I also found very interesting is that you also mentioned like more of the, not only the reaction in, in China, but also from other countries. And that also, you also link that to more of the historical connotation of the cyberpunk, like a neuromancer and, and blame. And there's also in, in the Western sort of, uh, people are afraid of Asian dominance by uh, technology or biotechnology. Um, so I, I was 
that was a really interesting point for me while reading your book. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think reading this experiment through science fiction, we have a deep archive that helps us understand what what happened, and also the the reaction of people in the English speaking world to this experiment. So. If you go back to an early British colonial novel, um, you can learn about Dr. Fu Manchu, this evil oriental genius who basically steals Western scientific knowledge and, and threatens the downfall of civilization. And you know, it's, it's a repeating figure. You, you see, um, even in the cyberpunk fiction of, of the 1990s, wh whether it's Snow Crash or, or Blade Runner, or you know, all these, these different Hollywood productions, but also fiction, um, you know, you see um, sort of these images of corrupted knowledge in the Orient. You, you see these black market um, genetic engineering dealers, and, and basically they get the aesthetic totally wrong. <laughs> you know, we're, we're to, Shenzhen is a city with the cleanest subway that I've seen on the planet. I mean, New York is disgusting these days. Shenzhen has a beautiful subway system. They have a taxi fleet that runs on entirely uh, electric. Um, you know, the, the city has made a big push to reduce urban pollution. And of course, you know, there's the disruptive like ride sharing apps. Um, it's not Uber, but it's like Uber. And, you know, now the, the gas burning cars are back on the road, much to the frustration of city planners. But, you know, Shenzhen has some of the biggest skyscrapers in the world, like a, a, a serious collection of super tall skyscrapers. Um, and, you know, every, every night at, at, at dusk, you see this light show play across them. So, you know, it, there's elements of Blade Runner in there. I mean, you see light shows on, on buildings in Blade Runner, but it's not the same grit. It's not the same, you know, hazy atmosphere. It's, it's, it's a, a city that's, um, you know, cleaner and um, I don't know, I mean, in, in places almost too sterile, but, but then they also have like forests and, and you know, uh, green spaces throughout the, the city. So it, it's an interesting place that confounds a lot of our images about, you know, um, who's leading in scientific and technological innovation. And, and this is precisely what, you know, President Xi and city planners are, are hoping to achieve. You know, this idea that Western modernity is, is one model of, you know, being in the world, but, but they want to usher in a new Asian future that displaces and disrupts the status quo of, of what's um, accepted as, as normal in the US and, and Europe. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, interesting point about, um, but also indeed how our collective fiction or science fiction history also influences the way we look at uh, current events. So yeah, that's um, that's one of the um, one of the things I also uh, really liked about your book is that I am sometimes called a techno optimist or techno utopist or <laughs> types even called a transhumanist well uh, and what i really like is a quote in your book by rua benjamin and uh, the quote is technical innovation and social inequality go hand in hand but uh, most of the times and i have the the feeling or the impression or maybe also the bias that technology will lead to a better world and, and less uh, social inequality but I think in your you really made 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 a good point that it's not, not per se always that case. Um, did you already have that idea, or did you find out about it in this particular case while doing the research for your book? Kind of both, and I've got two anecdotes that speak to that. One one from Philadelphia, and which had the first CRISPR experiment in the states and another from Shenzhen. I'll, I'll start with Shenzhen. So on this campus, you know, Dr. Hu's campus, which is like brand new, you know, less than five years old, I was astounded to learn that they had these supercomputing facilities, that they had, you know, like all kinds of crazy physics stuff, this CRISPR stuff, like, you know, the best science fiction professors in the nation. Um, but the students there didn't have potable water. They either had to boil their water or get it from a vending machine. <laughs> so, you know, some of the basic infrastructure that we take for granted in Europe, the US or Australia isn't there. And, you know, right outside of campus, there's these abandoned buildings where, where people are basically just like, you know, surviving on, on the outskirts of, of this, this city known for progress and innovation. I, I talked to, um, 
a fish farmer who um, basically was put out of business. This actually didn't make it into the book. Um, put out of business by this major typhoon that happened um, basically the, the same year that Dr. Ha did this experiment. This, this typhoon, you know, flooded his house. He showed me the water line, which was up over his head. Um, the bathroom to his place was destroyed. And he was scraping along. He, he didn't have enough time or money to rebuild his bathroom. Like, so halfway during the interview, like, I asked, like, is, I, I need to use the bathroom. Is there a place? And he just was totally embarrassed and said, like, uh, actually, you have to go, you see that pile of rubble over there? Like, that's my bathroom. Um, so this, these realities are, are side by side. And, um, you know, in Philly, where I'm visiting Penn Medicine, this place um, where Joe Biden launched the cancer moonshot, this uh, $100 million invest, investment in cutting edge cancer, a place where Sean Parker, this uh, Silicon Valley billion, billionaire, has invested a lot of money in the disruptive innovation potential of CRISPR. Um, I, I go there and I'm staying with a friend in Fishtown. And you know, this, this is a neighborhood where rapid gentrification is happening, where um, hypodermic needles litter the streets, where um, you know, people by the hundreds, by the thousands are sleeping outside in the summer because, because they're homeless. It's, it's a city where if you're African American or Latino and you happen to have cancer, you're unlikely to get it even diagnosed, um, much less one of these experimental CRISPR trials. Um, so I walk into the Cancer Survivor Hall of Fame at Penn Medicine, and it's all white people, which is predictable, except for one kid who I profile in the book, Nick Wilkins, an Asian American kid who's, whose parents were accountants. So, so in the US right now, at the same time, you have these innovative approaches to science and technology, you don't have guaranteed health care. Um, there's a lot of uninsured people, even with um, the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, who, who can't buy in to even basic cancer tests, much less some of these cutting edge therapies. So um, the, the therapy that has been approved out of that lab, Kim Raya, comes with a price tag that's um, you know, upwards of half a million dollars from Novartis. There's now a new gene therapy also from Novartis that's $2.1 million. And, you know, the insurance companies aren't paying for this. And, um, you know, it's basically ushered in this radical new era of medical inequality. Um, it was a controversy a number of years ago when a, um, a, an effective treatment for hepatitis C was discovered. Um, so you, you get um, this, this treatment um, costs $85,000 and you don't have to deal with the virus ever again. There was a huge controversy about the price tag of that treatment. And now we're seeing treatments that are orders of magnitude higher with these new gene therapies. So, you know, in, in the book, I explore some biohackers who are, are trying to be kind of the Robin Hoods of, of genetic engineering, you know, stealing the knowledge from the rich and trying to give these therapies from the poor. Um, but the fact of the matter is these are really hard to do. And um, in, in the book, I, I talk about one guy, David um, Aishi, who, who thought he'd sort of hacked his own body and made himself more muscular. Um, but when he actually did the lab work, it was the placebo effect. Um, so, you know, you, you can think about these tools as being super powerful and revolutionary, but, you know, to actually line up all the things to make the, the, the new biology work, it takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of trial and error. Um, so, you know, the, the vision is out there to disrupt the disruptors, you know, if, Silicon Valley wants to say, you know, we're going to deliver all these new drugs, um, these genetic cures that are going to be a one and done treatment. For, for starters, like there's not the evidence there yet. Um, the the uh, family that had their children in this leukemia gene therapy, I, I like use the word cure at one point when we're talking about what they had done. And and they just pushed back so hard. You know, they'd been through so many failed cancer treatments that you know, they were able to talk about a remission, but, you know, let's talk in 20, 30 years to see if this is a, a cure or not. So, um, you know, these, these, these treatments that are coming available are getting rolled out to the super rich. And, you know, we're seeing that in places like the US cut along predictable lines of race and class, but also globally, you know, I, I also work in Indonesia. I work in a part of Indonesia called West Papua, um, that, you know, used to be um, under Dutch colonial rule. And there, you can't get access to an ultrasound treatment reliably. You, 
you can't get access to a measles vaccine. You know, everyone's talking about COVID vaccines, like measles vaccines cost maybe like 50 cents to produce, but you know, we can't get them in an even way to everybody on this planet. So, you know, at, at the same time, we're talking about these innovative new futures in reproductive medicine, these new gene therapies, we have to think about lasting social and medical inequality and how this research is 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 part of this 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 story. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you put it nicely, uh, just like now in the interview, but also in your book. So yeah, that really was a lasting impression. So that that idea really resonated with me and was in my mind. Uh, it still is after a couple of weeks after finishing the book. So. Uh, thank you for um, for writing the book. And like I mentioned about biohackers, you also go to Indonesia, indeed, also in your book, and to the states and, and uh, to mainland China. So I I, I really recommend it. Uh, the book, The Mutant Project, by Ed uh, <laughs> Kirsty. Um, thank you for this uh, part of the interview, and we will continue for uh, ten more minutes. Uh, so thank you a lot. Thanks for having me on the show. And maybe as a plug for what's going to come next, uh, for the bit that you have to subscribe to, I, I'd like to talk about hope. You know, I, I'd like to talk about optimism a little bit after, you know, being a bit of a pessimist. Let's talk about hope. Yeah. Oh, let's do that first. Yeah. Let's talk about hope. Because, yeah, when I'm reading the book, I, we, I also had some hope, but maybe you, could, maybe you can elaborate on that. <laughs> Um, are you still hopeful about the future? <laughs> yeah, in certain ways. I mean, hope is a theme that runs through my work. And, um, you know, I, I think in science and, and technology, um, what you see, you know, you, you mentioned Ruha Benjamin. She's got this other wonderful phrase about the imagination being a battlefield. So, you know, all of us have hopes of various sorts, and all of us are imagining futures that might be a departure from the present lived reality. But it's sort of whose hopes about the future, whose dreams um, are actually getting closer to reality that I think we need to pay attention to. Um, so, so I just finished a, a, a piece actually yesterday about a, a, a gathering that happens every year, it used to happen before the pandemic, who knows what, what the new, new era uh, will, will have for the field of synthetic biology, but basically thousands of young um, biotechnology students, synthetic biologists come together in Boston every, every year um, for this event called iGEM. And you know they show off genetically modified organisms that they've made, various kinds of microbes, as, as well as new devices that, that they um, have created in the fields of biology. And, and in this piece, I'm, I'm really interested in, in kind of whose dreams are arriving and whose dreams are getting abandoned, whose, whose hopes are kind of gaining in reality effect as they get backing from you know, investors, as, as they turn into startup companies, as um, you know, certain government agents are, are policing the bounds of imagination, allowing some visions to move forward and, and denying others. And, and I'm finding that in this world, it's, it's similar. You know, I'm seeing um, inequalities shaped by national origin. I'm seeing um, inequality related to class and race getting replicated in these dreams about the future that are arriving. So I'm really interested in how power is, is, is structuring the future and limiting the horizons of hope. Hmm. So uh, do you mean that in the iGEM condition, there are more, there's more, there are more ideas about um, uh, public access of healthcare and these kinds of things and that it kind of changes when when power dynamics like money come in or uh... well, so so what i found was a lot of young people um who were interested in all sorts of ethics and in moral questions everything from you know one team was working on white nose disease in bats they were from missouri and um had invented a new synthetic microbe that they hoped would help treat this disease in bats um, one, one of the keynote lectures was delivered by John Cumbers of Symbio Beta, and he was there basically offering up to 150,000 um, to, to students who were able to offer him nothing more than an idea. And I talked to him directly about this particular project. I, in my mind, you know, 
designing a future that has room for other species besides people is an ethical one. And it's one that I want to live in. And, and I asked if he would support that kind of project. And, and he basically flat out said, no, like who's going to pay for it? And, and he, he mixed up, you know, it's called white nose disease that impacts a bunch of different bats. And, and he kind of confused that in his response to me, he says, you know, what are white nose bats going to do? Like, they're not going to pay for it for it themselves. So, you know, if, if this field is primarily about the promise of profit, and that's what is driving innovation, that's what's bringing the future closer to reality, you know, if that's the only value that is driving the field, then those are the futures that are going to arrive. And, and, and futures that are based on, you know, ethical ideas about, you know, keeping other species in the world or Another project um, that I was really interested in was trying to test um, for foodborne pathogens um, in um, street food. Um, so so the, the students were from NYU Abu Dhabi, and I later visited their campus. And, you know, they'd grown up in cities where they depended on street food. Um, you know, uh, many people in, in the global south these days don't have access to reliable food sources, but these vendors aren't subjected to government regulation. So these students wanted to develop a new device that would detect, okay, are there E. coli bacteria that are toxic in here? Is there listeria? Are there, you know, botulism? Um, all these things. And um, that, that's another example of one that just kind of didn't, the rubber didn't meet the road with that particular feature oriented vision. Later, that team also developed um, some prototype, um, interestingly, coronavirus tests that you might have in an airport. This was like a year before the pandemic. Um, wow. so, so I think they're, they're quite visionary. But, um, you know, in terms of just like inventorying all the iGEM projects that do turn into a stable thing and the ones that don't, I found that it was the ones that were kind of in service of profit that uh, actually arrived. Hmm. Yeah. Well... It's a really interesting example. Like uh, there is still hope in younger generations, but it's also not only about, like I think also comes across in your book, not only about the technology like uh, CRISPR or, but also about the whole context, about the, yeah, the, the system we are living in. So in, in a way that's hopeful, but also maybe it, it needs larger changes than, than only the invention of a new type of uh, genetic modification. Yeah. All right, Eben, um, if people are interested in your articles, your research work, your maybe your next book or your previous books, where they find you? Uh, EbenKirksey.space. Eben I will also put it in, uh, in the show notes uh, down below. So uh, Eben, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Please subscribe to my channel and also if you have a question or a remark, leave a comment down below. Go to my website if you want to have a free download and if you are interested in more in-depth knowledge and know-how about human enhancement, human augmentation, biohacking and the superhuman era.